Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Milena Stereo, and I'm Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Academic Enrichment at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. It is my pleasure to introduce you today's speaker, David D. Cole, the Honorable George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center and the incoming National Legal Director for the American Civil Liberties Union, commonly known as the ACLU. Since November 9th, many Americans have alternatively expressed fear and concern about the future of constitutional rights under President-elect Donald J. Trump, who during the course of his campaign promised, among other things, to build a wall, ban and deport Muslims, and expand libel laws. The outcry from progressives and others who worry about the future of civil liberties under President Trump's administration has been fierce. Donations to the ACLU and other nonprofits who protect and advocate for the rights of women, youth, and LGBTQ individuals, as well as other racial and ethnic minorities, have witnessed an unprecedented increase. The ACLU received $1.7 million in donations on Giving Tuesday alone, a nearly 1,000% increase over 2015. <laughs> If this surprises you, today's speaker will explain why it shouldn't and why historically the most effective constitutional changes come from ordinary engaged citizens, not from lawyers or the courts. An argument outlined in his most recent book, Engines of Liberty, The Power of Citizen Activists to Make Constitutional Law which you can conveniently buy on your way out. <laughs> a constitutional lawyer and litigator, Mr. Cole joined the Georgetown Law Center faculty in 1990 and was named the Law Center's inaugural George A. Mitchell Professor of Law and Public Policy in 2014. He has litigated several significant Supreme Court cases, including Texas v. Johnson and United States v. Eichmann, which established First Amendment protection for flag burning. A prolific writer, Mr. Cole is the author or editor of 10 books, a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, and is the legal affairs correspondent for the nation. In July, he was named the new national legal director for the ACLU. In his new role, Mr. Cole will lead the ACLU Supreme Court practice and oversee the work of nearly 300 lawyers. Prior to joining the Law Center, Mr. Cole worked as a staff attorney for the Center for Constitutional Rights from 1985 to 1990. He received both his bachelor's and law degrees from Yale University. Mr. Cole has, has received many awards for his human rights work, including the inaugural Normal Dorsen Presidential Prize from the ACLU in 2013 for his lifetime commitment to civil liberties. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming David D. Cole. Uh, thank you, Melina, and, and thank you, Don, Dan. Uh, I am uh, really honored uh, to be here. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm a little humbled. Dan beforehand gave me the list of, uh, of you know people who've speak, spoken here before, and it's a, it's a, I think it's designed to make us as uh, speakers feel really nervous. Um, but uh, but what can I do? I, I um, you know he he said that you you're often a tribal lot. I guess that's why the person who arranged my travel from the city club at the bottom of her email it said go tribe. Um, <laughs> Well, but, when, but when I agreed to, to give this talk uh, uh, some time ago, I had no idea uh, that the world uh, would have changed uh, in, in, in uh, such a fundamental way. It's also the case that when I took uh, the ACLU uh, national legal director job, I had no idea uh, the world would change in the way that it did, uh, but it uh, did. And I have to... Um, uh, admit something at the outset, which is that I'm, uh, I was 
uh, raised in Chicago, and so I'm a Cubs fan. Uh, and I, and, and about, <laughs> about a week before uh, the election, I um, w you know, stayed up to watch Game 7 of the World Series, but I had to teach early the next morning. And so when the rain delay came, and it looked bad for the Cubs, I thought, well, I'm just going to go to bed. And I did, because I, I thought, who, you know, the rain delay could go on forever, and then this game could go on forever, and I have to teach in the morning. Uh, so I went to bed, and I woke up to good news for me. Um, so a week later, a week later, uh, watching the uh, election returns, uh, having to get up the next morning at 4.30 uh, to, go, to uh, go up to New York for an ACLU meeting, I thought I'd try the same strategy. Uh, the, uh, it looked bad for our side. Now, I will say the ACLU is nonpartisan, but I'm not there yet, so uh, I, I did have a view on the election. Looked bad for our side. I figured I might as well go to bed. Uh, maybe uh, miracles will happen twice. Uh, they didn't. Um, so, uh, so here we are. Um, but I, I do have to say that, so, so you know, at, at the ACLU, one of the things we were doing was thinking about how uh, we could uh, work with a Supreme Court that had a liberal majority for the first time in 40 years. Uh, you know, I, and that was very exciting to me. I, I went to uh, law school uh, in the uh, 1980s. I was taught by uh, professors who had all come up under the aegis of the Warren Court, the progressive social change Supreme Court. That's what they taught us constitutional law and the Supreme Court was all about. And then they threw us out into the world and I uh, practiced my entire career as a constitutional lawyer uh, under uh, conservative uh, uh, majority Supreme Courts. And, and, and had uh, Hillary won, uh, that would have uh, changed for the first time in 40 years. So it's uh, deeply disappointing to um, have to shift gears, all those memos about how we could you know, uh, move constitutional law in a positive way under a liberal uh, Supreme Court. Those, are, uh, those have been recycled. Uh, uh, but, but, it, uh, but at the same time, what better job to have in uh, the Trump era than a job which uh, uh, has me waking up every morning figuring out how I can uh, resist the abuses uh, that he wants to inflict on, uh, on, on all of us. So this was supposed to be a, book, a talk about my book, and it will, in a way, be a talk about um, uh, my book. Um, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the book is called Engines of Liberty, The Power of Citizen Activists to Make Constitutional Law. It's really about the power of civil society, about citizens' organizations uh, to make and enforce and defend constitutional law. It's about groups like uh, the ACLU, groups like the American Constitution Society, groups like the City Club that, are, that, are, that consist of citizens who come together because they care about the values that found our nation and about the power that they play in uh, making constitutional law real. If someone hadn't already taken this title, uh, a, a more accurate subtitle than the power of citizen activists to make constitutional law would have been the power of citizens united to make constitutional law, <laughs> but I didn't think I could use that. So, the, so from the standpoint of a civil libertarian, uh, the, 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 the immediate moment can be very um, uh, disappointing, deeply disappointing. In fact, at, at Georgetown, the, la the first couple days after the election, uh, they brought in comfort dogs. You know, we bring in the comfort dogs usually during exam time, but they brought them in a little early this, this time. Uh, and why is that? Well, uh, because we have elected uh, as president a man uh, who played on uh, our, our, our sort of lowest common denominator uh, uh, public traits, who played to misogyny, played to fear, uh, played to racism, uh, uh, played to um, uh, 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 anti-immigrant uh, hysteria, uh, promised a, a Muslim ban, promised a Muslim registry, promised to close down mosques, promised to criminalize abortion, uh, has uh, since been, elect, been elect, being elected, promised to strip citizens of their citizenship should they burn a flag, promised to lock up 
his opponent in the, uh, in the campaign, promised to revive waterboarding, to loosen liberal, uh, libel law protections, and to support aggressive stop and frisk racial profiling strategies of policing. What's more, he has a Republican Congress, uh, and he will have a Supreme Court uh, that also uh, consists of a majority of uh, conservative Republican appointees as soon as he gets his first nomination. So the question is, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we push back against that? Uh, it, seems, uh, it seems quite uh, daunting. So in a, in a, in a way, my, I, I offer my book, I didn't write my book for this purpose, but in a way the book serves, I think, as a reason for hope and a prescription for action in this type of uh, time. And why do I say that? Well, in the book I talk about how people who have commitments to constitutional norms uh, make those norms real and in the face of challenging, daunting odds. So, uh, and sometimes it's about changing the Constitution. Uh, so um, those who favored marriage equality, how is it that within about uh, 25 years, marriage equality went from being unthinkable uh, to uh, inevitable? Uh, those who favor the right to bear arms, the individual right to bear arms. That concept, the concept that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms, was rejected by uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger, a Republican conservative justice, in 1991 as one of the greatest frauds perpetrated on the American people by an, uh, by an interest group uh, in his lifetime, referring to the NRA. Well, the NRA took that, I think, as a challenge, uh, and uh, not, uh, 17 years later, uh, the Supreme Court recognized uh, the, the Second Amendment protects uh, a um, right to bear arms. And in the book, I talk about the strategies that groups of citizens committed to very different constitutional visions, marriage equality on the one hand, uh, the right to bear arms on the other, how they made those visions real. What were the strategies they used? How did they engage uh, uh, the public uh, in a variety of forms in order to make it possible to prevail on a claim uh, that had been rejected as, um, as hopeless um, uh, uh, just uh, when, when they began. But the third story in the book is really the most relevant to this uh, time because it's the story of how uh, civil liberties and human rights groups responded uh, to the Bush administration in the war on terror. And that's actually, um, uh, I think, uh, a, a relevant parallel. Because President Bush, after 9-11, uh, had a Republican majority Congress for most of, his, uh, 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 of that period. He had a uh, Supreme Court uh, that had, in fact, put him in office, right, uh, in Bush versus Gore. So they weren't likely to stand against him. He had massive public support after 9-11, after much more than Donald Trump has, which is, you know, Donald Trump doesn't even have majority support. Um, uh, 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 Bush had uh, massive public support. We had just been attacked uh, in, a, uh, in an unthinkable and horrific way by an organization that had uh, few friends uh, outside of the Taliban. There was no competing superpower to push back against us. And history taught that in times of crisis, the president gets to do what he thinks is necessary for, to, to, to further the security of the American people, and no one will stand in his way. And President Bush initially responded as if he had uh, the power to do whatever he wanted and no one would uh, stand in his, um, uh, in his way. Uh, so he authorized disappearing terrorist suspects into secret CIA prisons for years on end. He asserted the right to hold individuals at Guantanamo without charges, without even acknowledging who they were, without any sort of 
uh, hearing whatsoever. He authorized torture as an interrogation tactic. He authorized extraordinary rendition, where we would abduct people in uh, one country illegally uh, and then deliver them to a, another country so that, that, that had a record of torturing suspects so that it could torture the suspects uh, for us. Uh, he asserted the power of the executive as commander-in-chief to ignore uh, congressional limits on his, uh, on his authority, and he put in place a uh, warrantless wiretapping program of unprecedented breadth uh, aimed at uh, uh, U.S. citizens uh, and carried out by the National Security Agency. So, so that was uh, a, a, um, a, a, a quite a, a menu of, uh, of responses, um, but I think what is remarkable, I mean, in, some, in some ways, it's, it's less remarkable that he overreacted in the, in, in the time after, uh, given that that is often our pattern, uh, than that, there was, that, that by the time he had left office, he had curtailed virtually all of these um, uh, measures. So by the time he left office, the Supreme Court had ruled against the president and in favor of uh, enemy combatants in four separate uh, cases. Uh, president Bush had emptied out the CIA's uh, black sites where we were disappearing suspects, had uh, ended the, uh, the uh, extraordinary rendition program where we sent people to other countries to torture uh, uh, for, so they could torture them for us. He uh, had suspended our, our, the CIA's own uh, torture uh, interrogation uh, program. He had released over 500 of the Guantanamo uh, detainees. They were at, at, the, at its height, 779 people there, but over 500 of them were, were released by President Bush. Uh, and the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program was now under uh, uh, judicial supervision uh, and statutory authorization. It was still unprecedented in its scope, as we learned later, um, but it was uh, no longer uh, unilateral. So the question is, what accounts for this? Um, history uh, suggests that it would have come out otherwise, that the president gets to do what he wants. And it's not the case that President Bush uh, and probably more significantly, Vice President Cheney had, you know, cha had a change of heart during this period of time and decided actually what we did before was wrong. If you read their memoirs, they're absolutely certain that everything they did was absolutely um, right. So they didn't make these changes voluntarily. Neither Congress nor the court uh, ordered the administration to close the black sites, to release uh, any Guantanamo detainees, much less 500 of them, to stop extraordinary rendition, uh, to halt the, uh, uh, the torture program. Uh, so how did it happen? And I want to suggest uh, that uh, a significant part of the story is the work of civil society organizations, of citizens who cared coming together to resist these um, uh, measures and engaging in a variety of tactics, most of them outside of the courts altogether, uh, uh, to uh, make the changes uh, possible. And, and that's really the point of the book writ large, which is that we tend to think of constitutional law as being enforced by the Supreme Court uh, and to some extent also by the separation of powers, by the fact that we have separate branches within the federal government. Um, but in fact, I, I think when you look at questions like what caused President Bush to curtail all of these measures, when you, when you ask how did marriage equality go from unthinkable to inevitable, uh, and when you ask how did the uh, right to bear arms go from a fraud to being dismissed as a fraud to being recognized as a constitutional right, the answer is to be found in the, not in the judicial decisions of the court, the judicial decisions of the court play a part, but I think if you, but the real answer is to be found in the work of citizens coming together in organizations and fighting back in forums largely outside of the court so that they can enforce 
constitutional law or change uh, constitutional law. So if you think about constitutional law changing in terms of recognizing marriage equality as a sentence, the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell versus Hodges is the period at the end of the sentence, maybe the exclamation point at the end of the sentence, but I'd actually say just a period uh, because by the time it got to, uh, to 2015 and the Supreme Court was deciding that question, it was inevitable that marriage equality uh, would be recognized. And the, wor the, the, the words and the letters of the sentence itself uh, is our work as, uh, uh, as citizens. And so constitutional law is actually more democratic than we uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, than we sometimes think of it. So a couple of examples. So take uh, Guantanamo. One of the people I, um, I, I feature in the book is a guy named Michael Ratner. He was actually um, my mentor in my first uh, law job, which was at the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, a, uh, a public interest law organization in, uh, in New York City. And Michael Ratner uh, was the person who decided to sue President Bush over the detainees at Guantanamo. Uh, when nobody else uh, was, you know, was thinking about doing that or was willing uh, uh, to do that. And I asked him some years later, you know, so what do you think your chances of success were when you filed that case? And he said, none whatsoever. It was completely hopeless. Um, but he did it anyway. He did it anyway. And why was it completely helpless? Well, the, um, the precedent was against him. The legal precedent was against him. In, in, in the wake of World War II, the Supreme Court had ruled uh, in a case brought by um, uh, uh, enemy aliens, German prisoners, who had been tried for war crimes. They were challenging the constitutionality of their, of the, of their, of their crimes. And the court held, in the case called Johnson versus Eisentrager, Enemy aliens cannot bring habeas corpus actions to sue the President of the United States during a war, uh, period. That was the precedent. And what was, what was uh, Michael Ratner and the Center for Constitutional Rights trying to do? They were representing enemy aliens who were suing the President during an authorized armed conflict, um, uh, challenging the legality of their uh, detention. Uh, and the as I said, the court was uh, not likely to be with him. The court was, again, the court that put Bush into office. And the people weren't with him. The people weren't with him. I mean, you know, Guantanamo has become a, a, a sort of central rallying cry, but it wasn't at the outset. And, uh, and, 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 and you'll note that who was held at Guantanamo? Foreign nationals, not citizens. And the, 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 the administration's message to the people was, on this and so many other um, uh, initiatives, we're not asking you to sacrifice your liberties for some promise of greater security. We're gonna, we got a better deal for you. We will sacrifice their liberties for your security. We're going after foreign nationals. So the people weren't uh, rising up uh, in, in, in resistance. So, but, and nonetheless, he filed uh, he filed this, um, this lawsuit, and it was rejected in the district court with a citation to Johnson versus Eidentrager. It was rejected in the D.C. Circuit with a citation to Johnson versus Eidentrager. And then surprisingly, the Supreme Court took the case up and ruled, uh, ultimately ruled, uh, in his uh, favor. And that was the first of four decisions in which the court ruled in favor of alleged enemy combatants and against uh, President Bush. So how did that come about? How did it come about? Well, I never forget when I was in, I was in, I was, I went to hear the argument in the Supreme Court on that, in that case, and I was in line with um, Steve Shapiro, who's actually the, the outgoing legal director of the ACLU, and I said, Steve, what do you, how do you think this case is going to come out? He said, well, I don't know how it's going to come out, but I do know this, Korematsu has to be in the back of their minds. So Korematsu was the Supreme Court case from, 1940, from the 1940s where the Supreme Court upheld the internment of the Japanese uh, and Japanese Americans during World War II. Constitutional. And, 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 uh, but, but that case did not, th that battle did not end there. Civil society organizations, Japanese American groups and the ACLU worked tirelessly from the day that decision came down 
to challenge the validity and legitimacy of that decision. First, in small ways, seeking to get people's property back, seeking to get people's citizenship back who were interned, uh, ultimately to ask for a commission of inquiry, and finally, to get a formal apology passed by Congress, signed by Ronald Reagan, and $20,000 in uh, reparations uh, to, uh, to uh, the survivors. And they turned Korematsu from a precedent, which a president could rely on to say, I get to do what I want in a time of war, even if it's jailing people on the basis of race, into an anti-precedent about what we should not do, what mistakes we should not make in this time of crisis. And that, that point was brought home very dramatically in the case when uh, another civil society organization, the Brennan Center, uh, filed an amicus brief on behalf of Fred Korematsu himself in the uh, Guantanamo case saying, don't make the same mistake again. They also uh, uh, sought, sought out uh, alternative forums where they could get support. And since the targets of the vi violations were foreign nationals, not Americans, and since Americans, for the most part, didn't seem to care all that much, they, they realized, well, those foreign nationals are citizens of some country, and we can go to their country and get their people concerned and put, get their people to put pressure on their governments, which will then put pressure on our government. So they started in the UK. There were about nine British detainees at Guantanamo. Blair, Tony Blair's initial reaction was, they're being treated fine. I'm 100% behind President Bush. They're terrorists. They should be held at Guantanamo. They're getting bagels. There's nothing to complain about. Uh, but uh, what Michael Ratner did, along with a, a guy named Clive Stafford Smith and an organization called Reprieve, was to, um, was to focus the attention of the British public on the, 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 the notion that the, the United States was holding their people in this island without any kind of process, without any kind of hearing, without any kind of uh, opportunity to defend themselves. And they did, did it tirelessly, so tirelessly, that Tony Blair had to reverse himself and ask President Bush to return the British detainees, which he did. Um, uh, and when the first group of British detainees were released, the Tipton Three, the first thing they did was tell their stories about what happened to them at Guantanamo, including how they were tortured while they were interrogated. And that was published in the British media uh, about a month before the Supreme Court first heard argument in that case that Michael Ratner brought. And in that case that Michael Ratner brought, which was not about torture, it was just about whether the detainees had a right to a hearing in court to challenge the legality of their being detained at all, two justices asked about torture. They said, well, what happens if you're right, Mr. Clement, who was arguing for the Bush administration, if you're right that we, there's no judicial review, what happens if they're being tortured? And Mr. Clement's response was, oh, you don't need to worry about that. We don't torture. <laughs> well, that night, ABC, uh, 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 or not ABC, CBS, I, 60 Minutes 2, um, uh, pl pu put out the first photographs from Abu Ghraib. Uh, which demonstrated that, in fact, we did torture uh, and were remarkably similar to the accounts that the Guantanamo DTNAs had given uh, previously about their treatment. That also, like Korematsu, can't, can't help but have affected the court's inclination not to accept President Bush's assertion of unlimited power. Um, they... Uh, several Bush uh, officials who I interviewed for the book told me that the pressure that they were getting from European countries and uh, Middle Eastern countries, driven by the people of those countries who were pissed off at the way we were treating their people, made it extraordinarily difficult for us to engage in all kinds of bilateral and multilateral initiatives in the area of national security and in other areas as well, and strengthen the voices of those within the administration who were pushing for 
um, uh, uh, more curtailment. Um, uh, I talk in the book about a number of other strategies which in, uh, include framing, include uh, framing the, 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 the challenge or the tension that was presented by what President Bush as um, one of the rule of law versus lawlessness and how that frame was, um, was, uh, was sort of um, laid out and, and prevailed. That was not the President Bush's, uh, not surprisingly, that was not President Bush's frame. President Bush's frame was our security versus the asserted rights of foreign terrorists. If that's the frame in which the case goes to a court or the case goes to the American people, well, how, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious how it's going to get resolved. But if the frame is, and it was by the time these cases got to the court, the rule of law versus lawlessness, uh, then uh, it's not all that surprising that the court sided with the rule of law. So in the Bush era, I think what we see is that when organizations come together and engage in a variety of, um, uh, uh, of, of um, um, tactics to change the nature of the debate, to inspire resistance, even resistance outside of the United States, uh, they can bring that to bear on a president who has a pliant Congress, who has a court that supports him, who has a population that supports him in defense of uh, civil liberties. And that's what we're going to have to do uh, in the uh, coming uh, four years. President Trump doesn't have uh, the support of the American people. Uh, he does have the support of uh, a Republican Congress and likely will, and he will have the support of the court. But, he, but what, what, what that only underscores is the critical importance of civil society standing up uh, and pushing back. Um, I, I uh, close the book with a quote um, from Learned Hand, who was um, said to be the greatest judge, American judge, never to have sat on the Supreme Court. He certainly had the greatest name of a, of a judge not, uh, not to sit on the Supreme Court. And he, and he said, um, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. Now, like many quotes, this is an overstatement. We do actually need a constitution. We do need courts. We do need law. But it recognizes a critical and fundamental and profound truth, which is that those formal elements of the law are nothing if liberty doesn't lie in our hearts. And what ensures that liberty lies in our hearts, what nurtures the liberty that lies in our hearts, uh, are the organizations uh, that are committed to that liberty. Organizations like the ACLU, like the ACS, and like the City Club, uh, which is committed uh, to the freedom of expression. And that's what I find encouraging in the wake of um, the recent election. That is that there has been an outpouring of concern, an outpouring of support, precisely for those institutions of civil society upon which our constitutional liberty rests. Thank you very much. Today, we're enjoying a forum with David D. Cole, the Honorable George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center and incoming legal director at the ACLU. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it onto the program. 
We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Teddy Eisenberg, over here, and director of programming Stephanie Jansky, who's over here. May we have the first question, please? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, from the standpoint of immigration, do you think it would be better if we focused on one thing first, like, say, helping the DACA kids, instead of pushing what the whole agenda of what we would like to see regarding immigration reform? Well, I think, I, I, I think um, the, the battle uh, uh, in immigration is going to be largely defensive uh, at the outset. Uh, that is, uh, immigration reform in the sense of uh, enacting a statute which uh, provides a path to legalization for the many among us who've lived with us, who are our neighbors, who are our, uh, ki our, 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 our kids, uh, classmates in school and the like. That has to be the long-term uh, goal and strategy. But in the short term, uh, what is going to be needed is a response to the kinds of threats that um, uh, uh, President-elect Trump has made. Uh, the notion that he's going to single out and target Muslims, the notion that he's going to dramatically ramp up uh, deportation uh, efforts. President Obama already had de deportation efforts at uh, as high as they've been uh, in living memory. Uh, and, and, and to ramp them up even higher, as President Trump has, uh, has, has uh, said he would do, uh, will require uh, um, major shortcuts in the processes uh, that people are uh, entitled to will uh, undoubtedly involve all sorts of uh, violations at the front end in terms of identifying, surveilling, uh, searching, and arresting uh, people in order to identify who we're going to go after. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, I think we should be defensive at the outset. Uh, uh, and, and that's what, that's what um, uh, I, I think we, we certainly plan to do at the ACLU. Oh, sorry. So, uh, Professor Cole, thank you. Oh, I guess I, I let you hold that. Thanks. Um, as, a, as a journalist, um, and I'm sure you're very aware of the role that a free and vigorous press has played in driving civil society on these issues, particularly during the war on terror, where there were threats from the Bush Cheney administration to throw people in jail um, to expose many of the things that you talked about. Currently, uh, the press doesn't, doesn't have necessarily the resources they had in the 90s. We, we're now in ideological uh, you know, uh, camps, and so that the uh, recognition of the importance of what the media uncovers is maybe lost in the finger pointing. I wonder if you could address how you see that playing out in the scenario that you're sort of presenting to us for the next four years. Yeah. So um, that's a great question, I, you know, and, and, and the media is absolutely a critical part of this civil society that is essential if you're going to have a meaningful constitutional democracy, um, right? The, the role of the media in uh, bringing to light abuses, in, in um, uh, shedding light on the kinds of uh, measures that are taking place is, is essential. Uh, and the media played an essential role, as, as you suggest, in the, uh, in the, in the response to uh, the Bush years. I mean, it was the media uh, who, dis who put those pictures out of Abu Ghraib. It was the media who disclosed the uh, infamous uh, torture memo. Uh, it was the media in the more recently uh, that um, uh, disclosed the extent of the NSA's um, uh, um, tapping of our phones and our electronic uh, communications via computer and the like. And so I think the media is, a, is an essential player in this, uh, in this uh, role. I think, I think as with um, civil society organizations like Planned Parenthood or the ACLU, um, people understand that media is critical in these times as well. And so New York Times subscriptions have gone up uh, since Donald Trump uh, was elected. The Nation magazine tr uh, subscriptions have gone up uh, uh, since uh, Trump was elected. So there is a way in which there is uh, support. Support flows to those entities that we uh, hope will 
stand up to uh, the, uh, the administration, and, I, and, I, and I'm confident that they will uh, continue to do so. On the ideological division within the media, I, I think that's um, uh, really um, unfortunate. Uh, I'm not sure there's a whole lot we can do about it. Uh, I, I think uh, it's unfortunate because I think increasingly people get their news from siloed sources where they don't hear the other side, uh, whether that's Fox or MSNBC. There are certain things that can't be said on M MSNBC. There are certain things that can't be said on Fox. Uh, and that's really, uh, that's really too bad. Um, I think it's better uh, when, we, when we are um, uh, exposed to a range of views. But it's very difficult to um, you know, ensure that there is that you know, nice, orderly range of views like you have here at the City Club with John Boehner one day and me the next, right? It's difficult to, you know, so, so we can, we can um, support that as citizens and we can support those outlets that do that and I think we should because I think that is critical to our coming together as a nation and going forward. Um, but uh, uh, the government can't, um, uh, can't uh, uh, require that or regulate that. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't, I don't think we would trust the government uh, to do that. So, so in the end, it's about um, us as citizens valuing the kind of serious journalism that is not just uh, repeating what people want to hear, uh, but actually reporting on what happens. And that will play a critical role in the, uh, in, in the coming uh, um, uh, presidential period. Thanks for coming. As the only non-lawyer in the audience, and, and maybe my question I is... I hope not. I hope so. <laughs> maybe my question is a bit naive, but uh, what about the most important injustice uh, that we've experienced here in recent years, and that is that the majority vote did not prevail for the leadership uh, because of... Uh, <clears throat> the College of Electors. Is, yeah. there, is there anything we can do about that? <laughs> well, uh, you know, one can always hope. Um, I don't, I, you know, I, so, so yeah, the Electoral College is a, uh, is a wacky system. I mean, you know, one, one, one this is slightly, a slight tangent, but, you know, one of the things that I said to my students who were, many of my students, very, very, very um, disappointed and scared after this election, uh, uh, after the election results uh, came down. And, you know, people sort of very quickly go to, you know, this shows what a racist, misogynist, xenophobic country we are. And I said, you know, I don't think it shows that. Uh, you know, I think it shows uh, that we have a very closely partisan divided country uh, so that uh, Republicans are going to vote for the Republican candidate, um, uh, come hell or high water. Democrats are going to vote for the Democratic candidate, come hell or high water. And many of the people who voted for Donald Trump voted for Donald Trump because they did not want four or eight more years of a Democratic administration, not because they were racist, misogynist, xenophobic, etc. And he didn't even get the majority of the American people's vote. So if you imagine that we lived in a society in which the presidency was chosen the way democracies choose virtually all other positions and the way we choose all other positions by majority vote, the Democrats and probably many of the people in this room would have woken up the next day, you know, like Cubs fans. Thinking, Whoa, we survived, you know, we, 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 we prevailed. Uh, a sigh of relief, it was close, but we won. It would have been the same country, the same votes, and we would not be saying, oh my God, it shows that we're a racist, misogynist, xenophobic country. So yes, we have racist, misogynist, and xenophobic um, members of our, of our population, and the fact that, our, that our, the president-elect is one of them uh, is, is deeply disturbing and has encouraged more of them to come out uh, uh, and, 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 and spread their uh, vitriol. Um, but it's, I don't think it's an indictment on, the, on, the, on, on who we are. 
And that's why, I, I, again, I have faith that we, who we are, can stand up against this kind of threat. In terms of change in the Electoral College, yes, the Electoral College could be changed um, uh, in a variety of ways, not even requiring a constitutional amendment. If, if, the, uh, if enough states to make up 270 electoral votes agreed that they would put all of their electoral votes to the winner of the majority, whoever gets the majority vote nationally, that would be the end of the Electoral College, right? Because the Electoral College would simply then um, uh, rubber stamp uh, whoever got the, 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 the most votes. That would not require a constitutional amendment. It would require enough states to agree to that. Some states have uh, said they would do that if there were a, su a sufficient number, but we haven't had enough yet. People also talk about, well, the Electoral College members uh, don't have to vote for the person who they stood, said they were going to vote for when they got um, put up to the Electoral College, and some have said that they aren't going to vote for Trump, even though they were um, sent there by the Republican Party. Um, I, I'm not holding my breath for that account. I, I, I think we, we need to move forward, uh, and we need to focus on the challenges that um, we will face, and we need to um, accept the fact that President-elect Trump will be our president, um, uh, rather than hope uh, that um, somehow the Electoral College is going to save us from ourselves. But yeah, it's a crazy system. <laughs> That's true of a fair amount of our Constitution, but it's very hard to change. Hi, Dave. Um, <laughs> uh, I really liked the way you described what citizen activists can do in taking an issue from uh, the impossible or the inevitable, uh, impossible or unthinkable into the inevitable. Um, and I'm interested to know what are some other issues that you see traveling the, that path with the assistance of citizen activists in the future? Yeah. You know, what, what do you see making that, that transition? Uh, with the help of citizen activists, and, and what is currently on the path? Yeah. That's question one. Uh -huh. uh, the other question I have, I don't know if I'm allowed to, is um, we're all interested in free speech and freedom of expression here in this room, and I'm very concerned about the fake news issue and wondering if you or the ACLU has any plans to address fake news, which is, I don't know, if, is that really speech? <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, so, so, so on the first, on the, on the second question, um, fake news, you know, fake news is disturbing. Uh, I, you know, where I live in D.C., uh, um, uh, la this, this Sunday, a, um, a, a pizzeria that I actually go to quite, quite often uh, was um, uh, essentially attacked by a man bearing an assault rifle because he had read... Uh, accounts on social media that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex ring from this pizzeria. I mean, completely ridiculous uh, accounts, but they had, you know, spread sufficiently and led some idiot to uh, to go in there with a with an assault weapon. Luckily, no one was uh, was uh, was hurt, but it, it it could easily have come out uh, uh, very very differently. So, fake news is a is a is deeply concerning. The question is, what do you do about it, right? Um, we, and generally, uh, you know, we don't we don't trust the government to decide what's, you know, accurate, true news and what's inaccurate, false news, because we worry that they will um, enforce that uh, with a political agenda. Uh, and so, uh, and I think if we worry about the um, government doing that, I think we also ought to worry about some large corporate entity like Google or Facebook uh, doing that. Uh, you know, the, 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 the solution I think that the framers came up with and that has, uh, that, that has been the foundation of the First Amendment to fake news is more speech, not the suppression of, of, of fake news. In, in a social media world in which people are only reading what they want to read and they have these siloed uh, uh, outlets, uh, that's uh, not, a, um, not as satisfactory a response as it might otherwise be. But I think the risks of empowering some you know, overlord, whether it be the state or some large corporate entity, to decide what's fake and what's 
uh, not fake is, 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 is uh, are, are, are considerable. In terms of um, you know, other uh, constitutional change um, uh, reforms, you know, I think one of them uh, uh, concerns the right to die with dignity. Uh, you know, that is a, a claim that, um, you know, the, the way, if, if you look at the way the NRA and the gay rights groups did what they did, what you see is they used federalism to their advantage. They, 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 in, since the, fed, the, the, the Constitution was against them, constitutional law was against them, they couldn't win by just going to court and making a clever argument. What they did was they looked for other forums, alternative forums. In this country, we have 50 alternative forums, 51 if you count DC, uh, states in which you can um, make arguments based on state constitutional uh, 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 norms and, and, and provisions. And that's what they did. So the, um, the, the, the marriage equality group started in Vermont and then went to Massachusetts and Connecticut. The, uh, the NRA started all of its state level campaigns in Florida, so much so that Florida is known in the NRA as the gunshine state. Uh, and then they took those, you know, they took their victory there and repeated it in Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. So that by the time the question of the federal constitutional claim got to, uh, uh, got to the court, the states had already made substantial inroads on, in recognizing the right. And the arguments are the same. They're, uh, they're just, you know, it's just a, a different um, uh, foundation. Uh, state law versus federal law. And that's what the de Death with Dignity folks are, have been doing. They've been going state by state, and I think they now have six or seven states that recognize some form of death with dignity. And I think at some point that may be. Another one um, uh, is, I think, is, uh, Citizen, is Citizens United. Um, Citizens United is, is one of the most unpopular decisions that the Supreme Court has ever handed down. Um, polls show that something like uh, 80% of Americans think it was wrongly decided. 70-some percent of Republicans think it was wrongly decided, even though it's, you know, it was brought by Republican um, uh, supporters and supported by Republicans. Um, uh, and, and, and so, uh, the, you know, and there's a real, a real sense that the, the and here I, I, I should say the ACLU um, has a, is very suspicious of campaign finance reform because of the concern about incumbent self-protection. But speaking uh, in my own capacity as a non yet, not yet ACLU um, uh, official, you know, I think there's real concern that the, um, the uh, premise upon which our democracy rests, which is one person, one vote, a, you know, uh, fundamentally egalitarian premise is uh, greatly challenged by the amount of money that flows in unregulated fashion through our um, campaign system. And that, that view is fairly widely held. And there are a number of organizations uh, that have been working, again, at the local level to try to introduce reforms that might uh, ultimately provide a, uh, a basis for uh, overruling uh, Citizens United. Uh, another uh, one, which you won't like, uh, is the Right to Life movement, which has, uh, you know, as you know, has been fighting since Roe versus Wade was decided to overturn Roe versus Wade. And they had not succeeded in the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, they got close, but they did not succeed in overturning Roe versus Wade. But they have um, cut back significantly on the right. And uh, Pre President-elect Trump has, um, has uh, suggested that he will appoint a, a, uh, a justice who is committed to overturning uh, Roe versus Wade. So that battle will continue. And, you know, I, frankly, I think um, uh, they have made as much progress as they have because of the commitment of their civil society organizations, and they haven't made the progress they want, not so much because the court has stood up strong, but because of the commitment of civil society organizations who protect uh, the right to choose, like Planned Parenthood and um, the Center for Reproductive Rights uh, and the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. And the work of those organizations is going to be absolutely critical in the, uh, in the period to come. Um, hi, it's 
Great that she'll be joining our organization. Um, so my question goes back to what you were talking about in terms of the Supreme Court now being stacked with conservative justices. Um, as you know, the Ohio heartbeat bill is now on Governor Kasich's desk, and that's um, a part of the movement of going from state to state in, in hopes of repealing Roe versus v, v. Wade. Um, do you see um, a rollback of some of like, whether it be gay marriage or um, women's reproductive health rights, and how do we fight that as citizens um, and prevent that from happening? Yeah. So uh, those, absolutely the, those are um, significant risks. I, in the short term, I don't see Roe versus Wade getting overturned. Um, short term is defined by as long as Justice Kennedy stays on the court uh, and Justice Ginsburg and Breyer stay healthy. Um, Right, there are, there are uh, five votes on the court right now to sustain um, uh, uh, reproductive choice. And in fact, just last term, um, in a decision joined by Justice Kennedy, the court, um, uh, in a case called Whole Women's Health, struck down uh, Texas uh, restrictions on abortion, which were disguised as designed to protect the health of women, but the court said, uh, they could see through that disguise. So, the, and, 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 and that was, those five justices are going to be on the court even after um, uh, uh, Trump gets his nomination. But the next nomination, right, if Kennedy steps down, if Breyer or, uh, Breyer or Ginsburg, I, I, don't, I don't think they will step down, but if they, are, if they have to uh, leave because of uh, health issues, uh, then he gets another appointment. He has five uh, 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 five, there, there are five uh, appointments presumably committed to overturning Roe versus Wade, and it is, it is uh, at, 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 grave, uh, at grave risk. I think whether they overturn Roe versus Wade, though, and this is really sort of, this is the sort of deeper point of this book, right? Whether they overturn Roe versus Wade ma depends less on his uh, appointing a fifth justice than it does on how we respond. Uh, you know, if, if we respond in ways that make it clear that it would be very costly to the legitimacy of the court uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade at this stage, someone, I predict, someone will blink, probably Chief Justice Roberts, but uh, somebody will blink. And, and as with Obamacare, right, Just, Chief Justice Roberts blinked and they uh, upheld uh, uh, Obamacare, and so um, so is so we, we tend to focus on who you know who are the people on the court. What is the um, um, uh, you know what's the vote count uh, on, on particular issues? But um, but I think in fact you know when, when you look at how constitutional law evolves over time, it is more about who within the within society has been more effective at shaping um, uh, public attitudes and views about the most fundamental principles that define us as a, as a people. That's where our um, fight uh, has to be focused. Thank you very much. Today at the City Club, we're enjoying a forum with David D. Cole, the Honorable George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law, Cent Law Center and incoming legal director of the ACLU. Today's forum is the John W. Barclay Memorial Forum made possible by a generous gift from his estate. Michelle Connell and Sarah Radke of Squire Patton Boggs are with us today. We thank you for your continued support of the City Club. Community partners for today's forum include the ACLU of Ohio, Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University, and the Northeast Ohio chapter of the American Constitution Society. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We thank all of you for your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler and the Longview Foundation. Additionally, we welcome students from MC Squared STEM High School. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the Laub Foundation. We thank all of you for being here today. The sale of Mr. Cole's book, Engines of Liberty, The Power of Citizen Activists to Make Constitutional Law, is provided by a cultural exchange. 
And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.